going to continue a series today uh, called The Secret Place where we're talking about the importance and the power of our relationship with God. If you have a Bible with you, uh, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. The message will be titled today, A Miracle Behind Closed Doors. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves and Elisha said to her what shall I do for you and we're going to pause for just a moment the background of the story is this woman was a widow her husband just died and she gives us pretty much a resume of her husband who happens to be one of the sons of the prophets now in those days prophets they didn't just prophesy but they also had certain schools where people would go and learn about the ministry the office and the gift of prophecy as it happens today we have a school of internship but they had a, like an internship for prophets so her fa her her husband it doesn't say that in here he was actually a prophet he probably was a church history says he was a prophet Abadiah we don't know that for sure but whether he was a prophet or not we don't know one thing we know is that he actually went and was a son of a prophet meaning his spiritual father was one of those prophets and on top of that he directly served prophet Elisha whether he mowed his lawn, picked up, carried his Bible, washed his car, we don't know. But somehow, some way, he was volunteering at Elisha's ministry. On the top of that, he was fearing the Lord. In other words, he went through growth track. He went through the internship. He went through the second internship. He never missed the prophetic encounter. And the freedom weekend that's coming up, he was there too. And after a while what happened is that he decided you know that's not enough. I'm gonna serve every month. Where is the need? Kids zone? I'm gonna serve once a month at kids zone. I'm gonna serve with the camera and so he volunteered, he served, he was a son and on the top of that he feared the Lord meaning he was there at prayer. He prayed, he read his word, he followed God and I want you to see this and she says all this was happening and we were broke. In fact, we were so broke that we didn't have enough money to pay for our bills. We were so poor that we had to borrow money and he died and never got a breakthrough. I want, I want to show something from this verse. One, when you serve God, your situation is not an indication you don't serve God. Sometimes the enemy, fall wrong teaching, will tell us that if you really serve God, you will never have a sickness. If you really have faith, you will never face challenges. But the presence of our problem is not an indication of the absence of God. Presence of a storm is not an indication of the absence of Jesus. Jesus was in a storm and he was still there. The four, three Hebrew boys went through the fire but Jesus was there among them. And I think we have to remove this myth and this lie that if I serve God, nothing bad will ever happen to me. If something bad happens to me, it means something is wrong with my relationship with God. Now sometimes it could be lack of our faith. Sometimes it could be, you know, we try to get rich too fast. Sometimes it could be we were trying to keep up with Jonas's. Sometimes it could be we fell for the sale sign on, in the mall. Sometimes it could be the new uh, Apple product that was offering. We did not need to exchange the old one but the greed got the best of us and we went for it. Sometimes it could be a problem but in this case the prophet doesn't rebuke the woman and says that it was your fault or it was God's fault, anything of that. He says, listen, she comes and she said, we served God but we had some problems. You can serve God and maybe you have some problems. I want to tell you something. That is not a sign you don't have faith. That is not a sign you don't have righteousness. That is not a sign that God is not pleased with you. God is completely comfortable, loves you and He is right there. With that said, it's also not a sign that God sent it. The prophet didn't say it's God's will that you broke. It's God's will that your kids are being sold on eBay. Prophet did not say, well, this is God's will for you. So we have to see the problem is not a proof that God left me. And the problem is not a proof that He approved them. A problem is an opportunity 
for me to trust in God and see His glory. A problem is an opportunity for me to express my faith in God and say, Lord, I don't understand why it came, how it came. It's kind of confusing. I've been serving you. I walked in the fear of you. Lord, I went through the school. I went through this. I volunteered, but I still have some problems. But God, I know that in the midst of all of that, you're bigger than the problem. I trust you and I believe for a miracle. Any God-serving people we have in the house this afternoon? Any God-fearing people we have in this house afternoon? If you still have a problem, I want to tell you God still has a promise. God still has His presence. God still has a miracle. And see what I don't see about her husband is that he was a servant, he was a son and he feared God. But nowhere do I see that he actually went to the prophet with his problem. Don't hide your problem. Don't make deals with your problem. Bring it to God. I know this is Sunday School 101 but bring your issues to God. The Bible says bring your cares to the Lord for He cares for you. Bring your debts to the Lord. Bring your children. Bring your spouse. Bring the fact that you don't have a spouse to the Lord. Bring your dreams. Bring your needs. Bring your things to God because you must understand that God you serve loves you. That God you serve has got your back. You know sometimes it discourages us especially when we've been serving God for a long time and we find that we're struggling, we're suffering and it seems like people who are not serving God are doing better and then it kind of drives us crazy a little bit. Let's just be real. A synagogue leader comes to Jesus, his daughter is sick, has a problem. Jesus says, I will be there and I will help you. Jesus is walking with the synagogue, leader of the synagogue and right there he gets the news. Your daughter has just went from being sick to dead. She's dead. And the servants give that man a tip right away. They say, do not trouble the teacher. Sometimes when we walk with the Lord and our life gets worse, the devil will tell us, don't trouble with the Lord anymore. Don't trouble serving God anymore. Don't trouble believing anymore. Look what that got in you take a distance from Jesus but when Jesus heard that devil news don't trouble with the teacher he stopped and he says to that man he says do not be afraid only believe if following Jesus makes things worse keep following Jesus because you never know what's behind the corner you never know what the next thing holds see you were expecting a healing he's planning resurrection if Jesus, if following God disappointed your expectation, trust Him to exceed your expectations. If you were believing for a healing, trust for resurrection. If the problem got worse, if the sickness got worse, and listen, you will say, but I was believing for this. Jesus says, do not be afraid, only believe. I am your God. You've been serving me. You've been following me. You've been fearing me. I got your back. I got your kids. I got your health. I got your marriage. I got you in the palm of my hand. I got you. Somebody shout, God's got me. Somebody shout, God's got me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The prophet says to her in verse 2, he says, so Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? I want you to see that the prophet doesn't give her a quick way out of her problem. If I would have been in the shoes of the prophet or you for example, you have a ministry, most likely prophet had finances. People came, people generously blessed him. We see that from the example of Naaman. So I'm pretty sure that he wasn't broke. He had some money. He could have easily wrote her a check and says, well, this is from prophet Elisha's ministry international helping the widow whose husband went through our internship, went through our growth track, has been faithfully serving his planning center, ser uh, planning center services confirming that his giving, we see that his giving record has been good. You know what? We're just going to help the widow. I mean, it's good to help the widows. The Bible says to help the widows and prophet Elisha is helping the widow. Prophet Elisha did not call the king something he could easily do. In the verses later on, Shunammite's woman, he offered her as a sign of favor to make a call to a king or a general. He could have easily called the king. The prophet Elisha could have started GoFundHer.com account for her. And within a few hours, you know, send a mass email to all of his constituents and, and he would have gotten her enough money. 
Prophet Elisha could have easily reached out to her debtors. He people who wanted to take her children and scare the living lights out of them. He could do that. He carried the double portion of his mentor. His mentor just simply sat on the mountain and opened his mouth and fire came and killed the guys who wanted to arrest him. Can you imagine what double portion anointing can do? He could send the fire and escape the, the overcome the distance barrier. He could have done all of these things but I want you to see that Elisha does not give her a, a, a money to her money solution. He gives her pretty much an idea. He gives her an opportunity. He gives her a way out so that she can be involved with God. In other words, he doesn't use the idea of give man a fish. He teaches her how to fish. I, I don't want us to be offended with God if God doesn't always write a paycheck to your problem. I don't want us to get frustrated with God if sometimes God will ask us to work with Him on the very thing that we worked ourselves into. Joyce Meyer says sometimes we give devil 20 years to get us into problem and we give God two minutes to get us out. See we have to learn to work with God. So God doesn't always want to do miracles for us. Sometimes He wants to do miracles with us. Why does He want to do that? It's because we are the ones that sometimes attract the very problems we have in our life. And if He changes everything about me but He doesn't change me, I have a tendency of finding the same problem in a matter of time. If God changes my wife but He doesn't change my attitude, my marriage will still be the same. If God changes your kids, mom and dad, but He doesn't change your attitude and doesn't change your parenting skills, things will not change in your family. God doesn't want to make your life better only. He wants to make you better at life. He's interested in improving me as much as He's improving my situation. And therefore in her case, and maybe it will be in your case, where the Lord will involve you in bringing change to your situation. Well, he will bring a change and transformation. Woman, what do you have in your house? I have nothing but a jar of oil, but a jar of oil. I want to speak today to people who feel like you lost something. Maybe lost everything. Like this woman, maybe you lost your husband. Maybe you lost your wife. Maybe you lost your business or a job. Maybe you lost your kids, they don't want to talk to you or you lost your parents, they turned their back on you. Maybe this week you got terminated from your job or you got laid off. And today maybe you feel like you have nothing. Maybe even in this nation you don't have proper documentations to be here and you feel like you don't have the opportunities. Maybe you have nothing in the area of education. Maybe you have nothing in the area of extra skills that other people have. Maybe you have no place to live. No dream of yours to live in your own place. Maybe you have nothing. And today I want to redirect your attention to not what you lost, but what you still have left in your house. The scripture says is that we as Christians carry in our earthen vessels the treasure of God. And that is the Holy Spirit. And when we lost everything, we must remember the Holy Spirit did not leave us. Maybe our understanding of the Holy Spirit is very small like this woman. She says a little bit of oil. What is that gonna do? Maybe our relationship with Holy Spirit is very small but nevertheless it's still a relationship. But nevertheless He's still with us. Nevertheless He's still in us. I want to encourage you when you are down to nothing, when you feel like you have nothing, begin to capitalize on the intimacy with the Holy Spirit that you have left in your house, in your heart, in your soul. When your husband is not listening, when your kids are not listening, when your wife maybe is not doing well, maybe your businesses are not keeping up, maybe your job has plateaued, maybe the doctor's report keep confirming the same incurable illness in your body, maybe the stock market has caused your situation to crush, maybe the things in school are not turning out well for you and you can finish your degree because the funding stopped. When you are down to nothing and you feel like you have nothing, I want to remind you that you do have something. In fact, it's someone on this Pentecost Sunday. I want to remind you that little bit of oil will do more than the size of your problem. What I lost, what you lost is not as big as what you have left. Because who you have left, he is bigger than your problem. I know you, little, you know so little about him, but he knows so much about you. Maybe you value Him so little, but He values you so much. His name is the Holy Spirit. 
He created this earth. He lives inside of you. He did not leave you when your mama left you. He did not leave you when your job failed. He did not leave you when your health gave out. He says, Lo, I am with you till the ends of the age. He is there in your house. He is there in your heart. He is there in your soul. He says, I know you know so little about me. But let's become friends. Let's establish a relationship because I hold the key to your solution. Somebody give God some praise for the Holy Ghost. I said, somebody give God some praise for the Holy Ghost. He is with us. He is in us. And He's going to be upon us. Come on, somebody. The Holy Spirit. If all you have is the Holy Spirit, for now, that's all you need. If all you got left is the Holy Spirit, He is all you now need. Develop a relationship with Him. You may say, but I know so little about the Holy Spirit. I know charismatics made him weird. Holy Spirit is not weird but he is wild. When he came on the day of Pentecost, no he wasn't weird but nor was he quiet. Holy Spirit is wild. He's not like a sensitive dove, he's like a wild goose. He disturbs everything he touches. Your revelation of the Holy Spirit might be so small but that's enough to begin that relationship when you're down to nothing. When nothing else is working, work on intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Joseph, if your brother's forsaken you, Pharaoh sold you on the market, God didn't leave you. Three Hebrew boys, they, they dropped you in the fire furnace. The fourth man is there with you. Disciples, if you are in a storm right now and the seas are raging against you, there is Jesus in your boat. God is there with you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. You didn't drop me before I got here. You didn't abandon me. You brought me to this. You'll bring me through this. I trust your presence in this situation. I trust your glory in this situation. The Spirit of the living God is inside of me. I know haters are gonna talk. I know people are gonna say that. I know my problem doesn't say that He is with me. It doesn't confirm anything. But listen, I have a witness inside of me because the Spirit witnesses to my spirit and it cries out, Abba Father. It cries out, Abba Father, it speaks in tongues through me, it speaks to me and says, I'm with you. I got your hand, I got your hand. I know you lost this and lost that, but I did not leave you, and I'm not planning to. I will see you through. Touch your neighbor, say, If he brought you to this, he'll bring you through this. The scripture says, What do you have in your house? and she says, I have nothing. If that is your situation today, what you have left is more powerful than what you lost. Let me say that again. What you have left is more powerful than what you lost. It doesn't feel like that in the moment. But it is the Spirit that created the material world. It is the Spirit that can recreate it. He made it. He can change it. He started. He can finish it. And I like what the prophet says to her. He says that you have a little bit of oil left. And he says, verse 3, then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. Go borrow vessels. Now we read that sometimes. You're like, yeah, great. Go borrow vessels. But think about it. What was her problem? What was this woman's problem? Her problem was that her husband did some borrowing and couldn't pay back. <laughs> so the reason why she's in this place now the reason why her kids are being actually auctioned off right now for labor is because her husband did some borrowing and it backfired. And the prophet tells her this now. He says, go borrow again. In fact, a lot. Imagine the fears that start surfacing again. Imagine the memories that come back. Yeah, I remember when we borrowed. We went to that bank. We went to those people. We went to those people. And he says, go to your neighbors. Go to your friends. Go to the same people and borrow more. Now, many of us in here, we understand how borrowing works. Many, pretty much probably everybody here has some kind of a debt that we live in. You know, whether it's mortgage or the purse that you came with or the shoes that you have or the phone that's in on payments or the TV or the dog. 
so some of us everything we have is on payments that's the culture we live in and um, borrowing for her symbolized a very painful experience borrowing for her meant what some for some of your marriages it's a place of pain it's a place of disappointment for her borrowing is for for some people they used to get pregnant because they had miscarriage it's a place of fear it's for her borrowing is for what some people starting something new is you it's a place where you failed it's a place where things did not work out what i want to let you know today is when you walk with the holy spirit he's not going to cater to your fears he's going to challenge you to face him holy spirit doesn't play babysitting with us he doesn't want to produce within us a glorified babies he builds within us soldiers and one of the first things he will do is he will encourage you strengthen you to face your fears that your second marriage won't be like the first one he will challenge your fears that you will not die like somebody in your family died at the age of 40 from that cancer he will challenge your fears and he will say that just because that thing failed it doesn't mean this thing will fail he will challenge your fears Israel that just because Pharaoh is coming back it doesn't mean you're going back to the slavery the Pharaoh you see today you see no more <laughs> Noah when the clouds gather together and it looks like another flood is coming I will bring you a rainbow to remind you what happened before is not going to repeat again the flood of yesterday will not repeat in your future see God wants us to know God wants us to challenge our fears that if we've been failed if we've experienced exp hurt or pain that we're afraid to trust we're afraid to risk we're afraid to jump again and say Lord I just want to be calculated and cautious with the Holy Spirit you will be challenged to challenge your fears somebody say amen Jesus came first time on earth they crucified him second time is coming ain't gonna be like that he's not coming in as a baby he's coming as a king he's not coming people to be mocking spitting plucking his beard he's coming on a horse and no he's not going to be coming by himself with just 12 disciples from Galilee he's going to be coming with an army of saints actually you and I are going to be there he's not going to come and ask do you want to follow me he says I am the king this is my territory bow he's going to come like a boss what does that mean Jesus is not afraid to come back fearing same thing will happen the first time and that's why you should never be afraid to go into a new situation with the Holy Spirit fearing same thing will happen as it happened before it's not going to happen to your Savior I believe it's not going to happen to you I believe you can challenge your fears I believe you can stand today and tell the devil listen get behind me devil why I have a promise from God I'm not alone I am with the Holy Ghost he is on my side and this failure is not going to repeat in my life this failure will not define my life it will refine me but it won't define me because I'm a child of most high God somebody give God some praise right now if you are not paralyzed by your failure give God some praise your divorce doesn't define you give God some praise your sickness doesn't define you give God some praise right now come on somebody hallelujah touch your neighbor say face your fear touch your neighbor say you may feel it but you gotta fight it the scripture says verse 3 go borrow vessels from everywhere all of your neighbors empty vessels do not gather gather just a few and when you have come in you shall shut the door behind you you and your sons and pour into all those vessels and set aside full ones I want to show you right now that God wants to start a miracle I mentioned already in our mind meaning where fear is gone even if you have that sickness the fear of that sickness is gone even if you have that problem the fear of that problem is gone even if you're facing that the fear is gone when God kills the fear the Spirit of God has the freedom to move but the second area where the miracle will happen is behind closed doors he tells this woman this he says I want you to gather these vessels which takes already overcoming fear of borrowing and I want you to go into your house and close the door behind you this is talking about secret place the secret of your miracle is in your secret place the secret of your future 
is in your secret place. For a lot of people their secret is their connections. For some people their secret is their education. For some people it's their ability to maneuver and manipulate people. Your secret widow is in your secret place. When you go into your room, Matthew 6, 6 says, and shut the door behind you. Speak to your father who is in secret. And he who sees you in secret, he will reward you publicly. These two verses, I see them intertwined. One thing we do in our secret place is we close the door. Why we close the door? So God can open the window. What does that mean? Close the door of distraction in your secret place. When you have your time with the Lord this week, a lot of people, they, they have every door open when they speak, speak to God. Every possible opportunity. And today, I'm going to give you one door that every single person has. It's the phone. If the Lord will do this scripture today, He will say, turn off your phone. He wouldn't say, close the door. He would say, leave your phone. It's not your adopted child. He will be fine. Something happens when you close down the doors of distraction in your secret place. You tell God, you're the most important person in my life. Bible said, we, we, we use this thing in our culture, we say pay attention. The currency of the secret place is not your money, it's your attention. You pay with it. People say, how do you pay a price for intimacy with God? With attention. You don't bring gold, silver, precious stones. The greatest currency in your prayer time is your attention. And this is the demonic, not this or this, but a symbol of this, doors, distractions, cares of life. What they do is this, is they rob us. So we come to a secret place. Watch this. We don't pay anything in a secret place because we're all over the place and we get nothing out because we pay nothing. The price of your secret place is your attention. Pay attention. Touch your neighbor, say pay attention. Come on, touch your neighbor, say pay attention. Pay the price of your attention. Give God your focus. And some of us, we are the most distracted generation. We got diagnosis for that now. We have pills for that now. And sometimes all it takes is honestly, turn things off. Go to your secret place and pay attention. That's what I found out. What benefits my secret place is when I'm able to give God a payment and my payment comes in the form of my full attention. The crazy part is when you work, you give your full attention to that. Many of you, when you work, you don't speak in tongues. But when you speak in tongues, you work. Meaning your mind is distracted. And he tells this woman, you want a miracle? Learn the secret of the secret place. Pay a price to be in a secret place. Shut the door behind you. All the married folk understand. Well, the women in the marriage understand. If you want to have intimacy, close the door. The reason why God wants you to close the door, he wants to have intimacy. The reason because intimacy happens behind closed doors. When you close the door of distraction, God begins to open the windows of heaven. When your attention is given to Him, you pay a price of attention. He begins to give you His revelation, His guidance. I want you to see the second thing. He tells her in a secret place, not only we close the door, He tells her in a secret place, I want you to bring the vessels into the secret place. And He signifies this specifically empty vessels. Somebody say empty. What that means is in a secret place, I must empty my mind of life's problems so God can fill it with His peace. Sometimes this takes the longest time in a secret place. It's to empty your mind of its problems. See, life has a way of creeping in inside. Life has a way of draining us and pulling us down. And many times we come into a secret place and honestly we are weighted down with the cares of life and that is normal. That's why the prophet gives her an instruction. He says when you get to the secret place, close the door, meaning pay attention. And then he says make sure that all the dust, all the leaves, all the other water that is there. Because see I have oil. You came with water. Dump the water out. Dump the problem so I can fill it with oil and with my peace. Sometimes you have to take 70-80% of dumping stuff that is is here before the Lord. How do you do that? You talk about it. You don't pretend it doesn't exist. You don't, con you don't apologize to God for being anxious. You talk to God about what's on your mind so it can get through your heart and God can clear the path and start pouring oil into your heart. Call His peace, His glory and in there is where the miracles begin to happen. 
sometimes people say I am so distracted in prayer with my thoughts you know Vlad I turned off my phone you know I woke up a little bit earlier so that nobody is distracting me but my mind is running rampant my best solution to that is this talk to God about what's on your mind and you will see your mind subsides your vessel becomes empty our goal is not to empty our mind that's Buddhism it's open door for the devil our goal is to empty it so God can fill it with his peace with his promise and his provision can somebody say amen in a secret place I close the door in a secret place I bring my mind if it's filled with dust and water I dump it I try to tell Lord this is who hurt me this is who what worries me this is what I have Lord I oh, emptying it out so that God can fill me with his peace and I want you to see that what else he says next he says and when that begins to happen oil will start flowing what catches my attention is the fact that oil started to flow and it did not stop because God from heaven said that's enough it's because a woman from earth said I don't have any more vessels that tells me watch this very carefully the flow of oil is proportional to my faith not God's will oil stopped when when the woman ran out of vessels not when God ran out of his grace Holy Spirit is restricted not by God but by our, our faith a lot of times people who have only one vessel or two vessels or three vessels experience a particular move of the Holy Spirit in their life not because it is the will of God but it is a lot of times our traditional unrenewed thinking full of fear for example people who only believe that God can save people typically see salvations people who believe God can heal people they see healings people who believe that God can use you to prophesy start prophesying if in your subconscious mind you believe God doesn't deliver people today it's weird how it works out he stops delivering and then of course you create a doctrine to justify why he's not delivering if you believe God doesn't want to prosper you and God doesn't want you to have enough for you and for others God doesn't want to prosper you guess what happens when you don't have a vessel God has no oil God is not gonna force pouring oil that it starts spilling and creating a mess God respects your faith so much that he's willing to hold himself back if you don't have room for it that's why we tell God every service we got big vessels we got big vision Lord we have vision for masses thousands locally and millions globally my income today will become my tithe tomorrow that's why we believe that God will release young missionaries pastors and apostles the school that will be here it will impact not only kids it will impact nations that's why we believe that Tri-Cities will become the hub of the move of God and you may say why is God going to do it because his oil is gonna flow and it flows for every empty vessel give God some vessels to fill renew your thinking upgrade your understanding receive God's promise let it stretch your inside so God's grace will flow not only into your salvation but into your healing not only into your healing but into your deliverance not only into your deliverance but into your provision into your family into your kids into your business into every area of your life somebody give God some praise right now say flow Holy Spirit flow come on somebody say flow Holy Spirit flow in John chapter 7 verse 38 I think it says that but out of he who believes out of his belly will flow the rivers of living water everyone got the Holy Spirit but see when I have a secret place he flows but my secret place creates the flow my mind limits it my understanding restricts it my vision puts the cap on it and that's why it's possible to have a deep crazy powerful prayer life and have nothing happen in your life at all because God will have to also fill the empty these vessels and fill them with this promise secret place is the place where oil flows but our mind our thinking 
has to change that's why they you know they did studies on millionaires where you know they go bankrupt and a year later he's a millionaire again what happened with guys like that see their thinking level is different they look at money different than we do we look at money we want to right away improve impress our neighbors they look at money and instead of buying toys they buy things that could give them more money it's their thinking that changes and that's why you give them little they make a lot with it because they view money differently their understanding is shifted and the Lord wants us to know that you can have an amazing secret place where you flow in the Holy Spirit but if your thinking if your vision is small or no vision at all just a bunch of fear you don't believe God can heal you don't believe God can use you you don't believe nothing can happen so guess what happens the Holy Spirit just simply stops flowing you're just rejoicing in him but nothing changes on the outside I challenge you today upgrade your thinking update let it line up with the scripture not your parents financial income not the church that you came and grew up with but with the kingdom of God mentality can somebody say amen in the conclusion this woman does that in a secret place closes the door the oil is flowing the vessels are filled her kids are helping her out she comes back to the prophet and she says the following she went to him so she went from him shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her she poured it out now it came when the vessels were full she said to her son bring me another vessel and he said to her there is not another vessel and the oil ceased which is just a confirmation is the flow of the holy spirit is proportional to our faith verse 7 she came and told the man of god and he said go sell the oil pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest. That tells me that my public life will be reflecting my secret place. If you close yourself in a secret place, you spend time with the Lord and the oil is flowing, meaning you develop intimacy, you pay attention, you, you, you communicate with Holy Spirit, you empty your, your life of its problems, your mind of its problems, you ask God for His peace, God begins to give you motivation, God begins to give you peace, God begins to give you idea. You have to walk out of your secret place different. I think that we owe the world a different kind of life. We owe to the world a Christian who's spending time with God walks out different than those who don't spend time with God. That means there has to be something different about your face. Moses' face was shining. It has to be something different about our walk. When Jacob encountered God, he was limping has to be something different about the way we talk, the way we work, the way we deal, our attitude. Things have to be different. We can't walk in grumpy and walk out grumpy. We can't walk in negative and walk out pessimistic. We can't walk in, you know, all beaten down by problems and walk out more depressed. A secret place has to be a place where you walk out, you walk out different. Because the Father who sees you in the secret rewards you publicly. Meaning your public life has to bear a resemblance of your private devotion. Somebody say amen. Give me just 30 60 seconds to give you a financial little advice from prophet elisha this woman oil is flowing things are good she comes she says prophet what do i do next and prophet just gives her a dave ramsey class step three steps dave ramsey i think has seven he give her three it's a woman go on the street and sell the oil that you got now imagine she doesn't have a husband and most likely this woman probably never worked so she, he doesn't even have a resume and so this is a this is not america where women you know have free rights or same rights as men and this this is different place so imagine the prophet tells her now you go learn how to sell and sell the oil that you got and after you finish make sure that you don't buy the new kitchen that you always wanted your husband to upgrade your kitchen you don't go into dealership and buy a new car make sure you go and you pay things that you need to pay and then live on the rest three simple principles one when we spend time in a secret place, we must understand out of the secret place, God wants us to learn a skill we have yet not learned yet. A lot of times your secret place will provoke you into something new you actually never done before and it will make you uncomfortable because your first thing will be, I never sold anything. I don't know how to do that. Secret place creates new opportunities for which you're not educated yet. I remember when I felt in a secret place that God wanted me to write a book and I said, what? I don't do writing who's gonna publish it it was a completely new it was pretty much like selling something I don't know how to do that see a secret place will create an opportunity for a place of work or business that you have yet to google take a class and learn because a secret place doesn't always bless what you do sometimes it creates something you've never done before and this is where our laziness kicks in 
I don't know how to sell and we live with oil in a secret place and no money in our bank account because God wants you to learn to sell in other words God wants us to learn maybe a new skill God wants us to learn maybe something new that we've never learned before God wants us for crying out loud to work the second thing he says pay down your debts this means what this says get out of consumer debt there's something happens when you get a breakthrough when we get a breakthrough the temptation in our culture today is the moment you get a breakthrough you right away get a letter from your credit company your limit just got increased so I know you 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 maxed out your credit cards but you can open the new one the moment you get a breakthrough everywhere in the mall you qualify for that new thing that you always wanted to have and so what typically happens is that we feel we owe to tell the world I've been blessed but you can't tell the world you've been blessed if you take the breakthrough and pay down your consumer debt which is the source of your worry and the source of your marital conflict because if you pay it down you can prove to people you have a breakthrough and if you can prove to people you have a breakthrough you don't have a breakthrough because if it's not posted it's not real and so guess what happens we're driven by the need to impress people so instead of paying things down that we can have more joy here and more opportunities and a little bit more life what we tend to do is we dig a problem deeper why because we need to impress somebody not because it brings us more life it's not because we really want that it's because somebody needs to know I got a breakthrough because we're more interested in looking rich than being rich and then he says the third thing and this is the scary part when I read it I had to reread it he says live on what's left <laughs> that's not a lot and <laughs> that's how much you're gonna live on if you want more increase that what typically happens is we end up living on what we love not on what we have left I love me a new car but my budget doesn't let me so guess what happens I can afford the payments and this is where our problem begins this is a prophetic insight into our finances it can change somebody's life today sell means learn something new that you've never learned develop a secret place learn to pay things down I'm talking about consumer debt so that your purse is not on payments your phone is not on payments so the tires on your car are not on payments the, the, the engine is on payments the battery is on payments everything is on payments so that yes you won't impress your friends and your family that you have a breakthrough but you and your wife will not talk, fight about finances but there's going to be peace about it you can take a vacation where you want to take a vacation and the next car you're not going to ask it how much are the payments you will ask is how much does it cost because you actually have the money Bible says he who's in debt is a slave people who live in debt myself included have a mortgage mortgage debt we are slaves and God wants us to be free not just free so we can give but free also so we can enjoy our finances and he says pay things down and the third thing is live on what's the rest I found the biggest source of our frustration is when we don't live within our means when we live based on our dreams instead of our means if you live within your means God will increase your means because you're faithful and then you'll be able to live as you love not on what you have left when me and my wife were married you know we we couldn't afford a lot of things first few years we didn't have a, a TV well that was for holiness reasons probably and budget reasons we had no internet and we barely could save I think $150 every single month and we lived in the apartment and things were not good but we made a decision we are gonna go on a date every single Thursday night the only problem is we had only $100 for a date so that meant that for a few years me and my wife had to go and split a meal we could only go to restaurants that provided big size meals for splitting I always carried a tea bag with me because hot water is free and tea bag is only 10 cents in Winko so you put the tea bag and you feel like you're royalty you know you're drinking tea and uh, one time I think in Olive Garden they charged me for tea three dollars and fifty cents oh I debated that with the manager I said I bought that I have a receipt that's from Winko that's not from your store you better remove that from my thing but I told my wife I said the reason why we're living like this is because we're living on what's left but there will be a day the dream of our life will go to a restaurant and you can order what you want 
and I'm like you can order with your eyes not with our envelope <laughs> you know and I remember that day came you know I told my, my wife and I said hey you can get it and you know my wife always her eyes always gravitate to the most expensive things <laughs> You know and she she would order something that's it's just a little bit more expensive and today I can live like that and I'm not talking about living spent wasting money I'm talking about when you can live on what's left you will live on how you love but the problem with many of us is we start when we don't have the finances to live how we love listen to this you will have to go to living on what's left it's better to start it now than later sell pay live God is a breakthrough for us it starts in our secret place behind closed doors and it will spill into our public place in Jesus name